Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda Baptist Church. It's good to see all of you this morning. Are you glad to be here? Yes. All right. Let's all turn our hymnals to hymn number 595. Hymn number 595. We're going to sing the first, second, and last verse, and let's all stand while we sing. Once again, it sure is good to see all of you this morning. We have a fun-filled, fun-packed day today. We have our fifth Sunday sing tonight. If you like to sing, we would love to have you come sing for us. Amen. And uh, we start at 6 o'clock tonight. And then we're going to have a meal or refreshments next door after that. So please come join us. We'd love to have you here. Do we have any first-time visitors with us? Any first-time visitors? Uh-huh. Right there. Right there. Right there. Uh -huh. Well, we do have one. But you know what? I'm going to reserve that for the privilege of the pastor. Okay. Once again, it's good to see all of you this morning. Let's open our service with a word of prayer. Our most gracious and lovely Father, Lord, we thank you for this time we can be in your house. We thank you for your love, your many blessings. You are so wonderful, and we praise you. You are so fantastic. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. This time that we have to hear your word preached, to hear people sing about you the love and the joy that you provide for us. Lord, you are so wonderful. Lord, we pray that you'll be with all those who are in leadership over, to, over us today, our president, our vice president, our national, state, and local governments. Lord, grant them wisdom. <laughs> Guide them. Help them to make the right decisions for this nation and for your people, Lord. We pray for our military, our law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs. Lord, touch them. Bless them. Provide for them. Keep them safe, Lord. Bless them for risking their lives every day for us. Lord, we pray for our schools. Lord, they're getting ready to go again. Please be with the teachers, faculty, and staff. Lord, help them to prepare for this new year. Help them to find the best ways to teach our children, the best ways to keep them safe in the schools. And Lord, we pray for all of our local churches, all those that serve the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Bless the services this morning. Bless all those that are singing, preaching, teaching for you. Guide us all, Lord. And, Lord, we pray especially for Bethesda Baptist Church today. Lord, please continue to help this church grow. Please continue to help us financially. Lord, please continue to help us to stand firmly on your word, your truth. Lord, bless this service today. Be with our pastor. Touch him. Guide him. Give him strength and courage to say exactly what you want him to say today. And, Lord, we ask that you touch our hearts 
with all that you have in store. Yes. Again, bless this service. Take control. May your will be done in this place today. All these things we ask in our precious and glorious Savior's name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's all turn our hymns to hymn number 430. Hymn number 430. And once again, we're going to sing the first, second, and last verse. And let's all stand while we sing. God, just love you and thank you, Lord, for this awesome privilege to come into your house and worship you, Father. Father, we just uh, we thank you for yesterday, Father, and just uh, blessing us with everybody that showed up, Father, just to make your yard and building look so much better for you, Father. And, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for all these blessings. We continue to lift up our sick, Father. Just continue to be with them, Father. We uh, thank you for the visitors today, Father. Just bless them, Father, and just encourage them and touch their hearts, Father. And, Father, we just thank you. And, Father, just... Uh, Ask you to be with our pastor today, Father, to speak through them like you never spoke through them before. And open our hearts and our minds, Father, to hear what you've laid on his heart, Father. Father, we just thank you. Just bless these offers and tithes, Father, and just continue to use us, Father, to spread your word and your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. This is going to be hard for me this morning. Uh, this song reminds me of somebody that, I'm sorry, I want to break down. I'll probably cry through the whole song. If you follow us on Facebook, I've got a little friend, of my, my, my sons and my daughter, she's 18 years old, in Charleston fighting for his life right now from a car accident. He lost his best friend. They just graduated from high school. Five kids in a car and crashed and one dead and the other one's fighting for his life. But he's making strides. He's, he's not brain dead. He knows who you are. He can, he can do things that you, he's not supposed to be doing. But God's working in his life and he's, he's going to heal him and he's going to make a full recovery. I believe it in Jesus' name. But we just want to sing. It's, 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 we've been on this trip Last Sunday we was at my home church. This Sunday we're at her, my wife's home church. It's nice to have two homes. It's it's everybody can't say that that they have two home churches, but I can, she can, and it's it's nice to have family and people around that you know is praying for you and has you back no matter what you're going through. So, 
Just worship with us today. There is a river of gladness that flows from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. And sinner walks in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. Sorry, it keeps skipping for some reason and it's throwing me off. It didn't skip before, did it? No. No. Maybe it's dirty. He's not screaming, so we're we're making strides. Baby, you want to say something while we wait? Y'all see that look she gave me? We'll talk after church. Stand up and show them, Ludell. He's holding his tw- his twin is holding him. So we're ready when you're ready, brother. She's not going to talk. There is a river of gladness. That pours from Emmanuel's veins The sinner was plunged Beneath the flood and God saved Since then I've walked in forgiveness The of my tears was erased The chains of the past I'm broken at last, I got saved, oh I got saved, I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord, I'm restored and made right, He got a hold of my life, I've got Jesus, how could I want Tasted and tasted your grace I was so lost till I fell at the cross And got saved, oh I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I've got Jesus How could I want more? The love of God Gave me His power The love of God Won't let me stay the same The love of God Calls me up higher His will is stronger That's why I got Of Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. 
How could I want more? I'm undone by the mercies of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I've got Jesus. How could I want more? Wow, that's been too long since we heard y'all sing. John, can can that camera zoom in right down here and then put it up on the screen like they do at the football games and stuff? Because <laughs> Ludell is Ludell ain't that bad. I want to introduce to y'all uh, my second grandson, okay? Because he's going to be held by my first grandson, Ty, okay, his older brother. Uh, and his, his older sister is not here today, uh, unfortunately, but that's okay. Uh, but I want to introduce you to Jackson Bennett Ludell Wahiho <laughs> Galloway Nelson, okay? So I'm going to ask him to come on up if they will. And somebody asked me where Wahiho comes from. You know, they live right on the border with Mexico. Matter of fact, actually, you can look out their back door and see the Rio Grande. That's how close they are uh, to Juarez. Um, and uh, Wajijo means pepper uh, in, in Mexican, you know what I'm saying? And, and believe me, if you're around him a little bit, you'll find out he can be a pepper. Uh, matter of fact, actually, when, when they came in on the, uh, uh, the flight uh, here uh, to, uh, to the world, Real world, home. Anyway, uh, we were. They landed about. I guess it was somewhere. We probably were. It was midnight or so when we were coming back. Something like that. And and uh, he was screaming at the top of his lungs. And I said, Ashley, what's? Just feed him. She said he's hungry. And you know what he was saying? He said, Wait till I go see my other grandparents and tell them that they brought me to Georgia and are starving me to death. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But. Uh, uh, it is good to have them here with us, and I, I don't guess that'll work, John. I don't know. I should have told you in advance. Um, but uh, you know with, uh, uh, you got to remember this kid was born in the desert, so he's not used to any kind of anything that grows. It's just <laughs> dust. That's all they have out there is dirt. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So when you bring him here where the green things are at, he's at a loss. That's why he's sneezing at <laughs> But Ashley asked me if I would do uh, a dedication uh, for Jackson. Uh, and, you know, we, Mother's Day, we did all the rest of our youngins. You know what I'm saying? So if you'll indulge me a little bit, I, I, I just want to say to them, just like I said to all the other parents, you know, uh, Jackson, is, is wonderful as he is, can't drive. So if Jack, well, he probably, he might could. Uh, but, but he can't drive himself to church. You know, our, our children, they can't drive themselves to church. And if the parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or what, whoever, friends, don't bring them, they can't come. So when we say we're going to do a baby dedication, as much as we're going to pray that Jackson grows in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, a lot of that's going to be on their parents on his brothers and sisters, that's, that's where it's going to come from. That's the ones that we really need to pray that they will dedicate themselves to raising Ludell in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So, <laughs> if you will allow me, no, hang on to him, brother. Hang on to him, because when I get him, he'll start squalling. Okay? <laughs> he does. Oh, really? Is he grunting? Okay. All right. So, see that? I told you. You got close to him, didn't I? So join me as I pray for y'all and I pray for Jackson. Father, my heart uh, is elated, 
Lord, uh, my family is here in church with us, and, and Lord, not just Jackson, but Rose and Ty, and, and, and Father, I, I'm just so thankful. Lord, I am blessed uh, beyond measure, and Father, you have uh, guided my steps, uh, and you, Lord, have always been a lamp to me. And, and Father, I thank you, Lord, for my children. I thank you, Father, for the paths that they have chosen, not just for themselves, but for their families. And, and that, Father, that, Lord, uh, they grew up in church, and, Father, they've stayed in church, and, Lord, they've stayed faithful to you, and I thank you for that. And Lord, I, I, I thank you, Lord, for my son-in-law. I thank you for my daughter-in-law. Father, I thank you, Father, that they uh, are helping to raise all my grandchildren in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And Father, today as we come, we thank you, Lord, for uh, this life that you've blessed us with. And Father, we would pray, Lord, I, I pray earnestly for my lovely daughter and her husband, Lord, that they will be the examples, Lord, to Ludell. Lord, that they will raise him in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And Father, uh, in the world in which we live, the secular society and culture that surrounds us, it will not be an easy task. Father, there will be days that will be trying. Father, there will be days, Lord, when they just don't know what to do. And Father, I pray that you'd give them wisdom. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the strength and the courage that they need Father, to raise Jackson in a way that would honor and glorify you. Bless their home with your presence. Father, allow your spirit to descend upon them. And, and Father, for, for Jackson's brother and sister that are so far away from him, Lord, bless them. Bless their lives, Lord, as they grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Watch over this home. And Father, today we will praise you. We will worship you and we will honor you for all things, because you are worthy. Because we've asked all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. And my family said with me, Amen. 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 All right, Ludell. All right, you ready? Tell them bye. I said, see you later. So I'm going over here to sit down. I couldn't understand why a grandmother would want a picture of a grandchild. My wife, for the whole time that she's owned a cell phone, has never known how to take a picture. And when, man, when, when Rose was born, she became a phone ninja. Man, she could whoop that thing out, take 14 pictures, and have sent them out to the entire world in three seconds flat. And still can't open an email. I ain't figured that out yet. So, but anyway. All right, uh, Leroy, are we ready to dismiss your crowd? They're headed that way. So our junior church is going to go out this door right here. Okay. And while they are dismissing, uh, I ask you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew, please. We're going to be in chapter 14. While you're turning there, uh, you heard in Brother Ray's prayer, and I am so thankful for all the folks that came out yesterday. Uh, it was hot. Uh, it was, I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? And those folks work like Trojans. Uh, you know, I, I asked the ladies to come out, you know, and I said, you know, it, once a year, twice a year, we kind of do a deep clean on the church. And, and I got here late as usual. And uh, four or five of the ladies met me out front and said, what do you want us to do? I said, well, I mean, you go inside. And they said, they, they don't need to, all that's clean. <laughs> So, we, so the next thing I know, you know, uh, two or three of them have got a chainsaw and they're out here back on this pond dam sawing down limbs and everything else. And I thought to myself, don't mess with those ladies. 
because uh, they will chop your leg off. But anyway, I'd like to thank all of the folks that came out. The grounds look so wonderful. You know, next week is our homecoming. 118 years here. So we want you to come out and be a part of that. Invite everybody that you know. It's going to be the best food you've ever eaten. Uh, we've got a singing group coming in after Brother uh, uh, Adam Walker is going to be here preaching for us. He preached last, uh, last year uh, at homecoming. So come on out and be a part of it. Invite everybody that you know, okay? Yes, Brother Wayne. Yes, yes. <laughs> We're going to get a zoom in on him. We'll put Brother Ernie's picture up here. <laughs> uh, but I'd like to also thank, we had a funeral here uh, yesterday afternoon, and the ladies, uh, you outdid yourself as always uh, and did an outstanding job. And I, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you uh, in all of your efforts to, to comfort this family. And, and I'd like to mention one other person, and I, uh, you know, Brother John came to do the media yesterday, and, and I know a lot of us don't see the things that are going on, and, and, and you know, we had a, a, a video that Miss Carol had been working on and helping with, and, and when we got the video back, we had some, some assistance from one of the funeral homes, uh, Starlings up there helped us a little bit. When we got the, the video back the, um, at uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock, uh, it wouldn't play. We got nothing we did would make the thing play. We tried everything. John, well, I didn't try nothing. John tried everything, every program we had that works with everything else, and it wouldn't make that disc play for nothing we did. So John went onto the internet and downloaded some programs that made it possible for us to be able to play uh, that video, and that meant the world to that family. And uh, and, I mean, he is doing all of this at the speed of sound uh, and just, like, working like a Trojan back there. So, Brother John, I want to thank you, sir, for all your hard work and effort. And I thank you so much. But it would not have been the same service had you not been here. So, uh, I thank you very Amen. Very, very much. Uh, and for all you do. And, and there's a lot of folks that are doing the exact same thing he is behind the scenes that you never see. Uh, that make this such a wonderful place. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, open them with me, please, to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, uh, I, we're going to finish up our Falling Forward series today. Uh, and the title of today's sermon is, It's Time to Get Out of the Boat. Anybody got any ideas of what we might be talking about today? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter was kind of impetuous, <laughs> impetuous wasn't he? Uh, you know what I'm saying? I want you to, to notice something about this, and i give you a little bit of background. The disciples are crossing over. Uh, Jesus has gone into the mountains to pray, okay? And they have just fed five, 10,000 people. They have just witnessed a miracle, okay? Now, a lot of people would say that Peter... Uh, was out of the will of the Lord, or maybe the disciples were out of the will of the Lord. But really, when you read this account, guess what you find out? They were exactly where God intended them to be, all right? Look with me in verse 22 of this verse. It says, in straightway, or, or chapter 14, it says, in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. Now, that word constrain doesn't mean he had to motivate them. That word constrain doesn't mean that he talked them into it. That word constrain means he made them get into the boat. Now, if Jesus is God, and he is, do you think that they were going to, that Jesus knew they were going to get out in the middle of this thing and wind up in a storm? So what you're saying, preacher, is, is that sometimes God allows storms in our life for a purpose. Nod your head. Matter of fact, actually, if you'll think about your life for just a minute, there are two types of storms that come into our lives. 
One of them are the storms of correction. Now, anybody remember a guy by the name of Jonah? Remember the fish story? God said, I want you to go down to Nineveh. Anybody remember what Jonah's response was? He bought a first class ticket going in the other direction. Is that not right? Because I'm not going down there because if I do and I preach to him, you're going to forgive him. Okay? Sometimes God allows storms in our lives to bring us back to where we need to be. Amen? Matter of fact, actually, if you think about the, uh, the story of Jonah for just a minute, when everything started getting really in bad shape, guess what Jonah said? The reason you're having trouble is because of me. They tried to throw everything over the ship to keep from sinking, and Jonah said, throw me overboard. And when they threw him overboard, guess what happened? Uh, the storm stopped, right? The fish got him, okay? But the idea is, is that guess what? Sometimes our storms are of our own making. Say amen. Sometimes we do knuckleheaded things contrary to God's will because we don't want to do that. And so God allows storms to come into our lives. But there's another type of storm, and I think that's what this one is. And that's the storms of perfecting or perfection. And that is the idea that, guess what? God is trying to grow us. Now, I don't know about you, but Ludell over there is going to face some times in his life that are going to break his mother and father's heart. There are going to be some times that, guess what? He's going to get picked on. I don't know by who. Their dog Axel, probably. And there are going to be some times that parents are going to jump up, want to jump in and get right in the middle. But guess what? As hard as it may be, sometimes you have to teach your children to stand up for themselves. Amen? And that may not always be a pleasant experience for them, but here's the deal. If you don't ever to teach them to stand up for themselves, when they're 55 years old, they're going to be living in your basement. Playing video games. Because the world is too tough a place for them to be. I read an article the other day about uh, uh, out on the left coast in California. And I still believe that's another country. Where this man was getting disability because he had stress in his life. And I thought to myself, he could no longer work because... It brought stress into his life. And I thought to myself, you know, every time I get out and mow the grass, I think I have that same disorder. Because <laughs> my face gets red, and I start sweating, as Brother Sonny calls it, leaking. I start leaking, and, and you know, sometimes your breath gets kind of fast, you know. But <laughs> they never said, hey, gee, come out of that stress. And we'll pay you to sit at home. Of course, that's the left coast again. So the idea is, is that guess what? Growing sometimes is hard. Okay? Growing requires that you have to be stretched. In other words, you got to get out of your comfort zone. Now, my daughter, not now because she's got Ludell, okay? But my daughter used to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go running. Why Trent married her, I have no idea. Because I asked her, I said, darling, was somebody after you? She said, no. I said, was a dog chasing you? She said, no. I said, were you running out of the house because it was on fire? She said, no. What in the world are you doing out at 5 o'clock in the morning running around the block? Because that's the only things I could think of that might run me out. She said, well, I want to stay in shape. And I told her, I said, darling, look at me. I've been in shape like this since high school. (laughs) And have never got up once at 5 o'clock in the morning and ran across it around the block. So growing sometimes requires us to stretch. Okay? And so, in so doing, God... 
constrain them to get into the boat. Now, go with me to verse 23. It says, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountains apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, I want you to notice something here, that when did he send the multitude away? Anybody got any idea? It was still daylight. Is that not right? It was still daytime because it said in the evening, where did he go? It went up into the mountains. That's exactly right. Well, here's the deal. Think about it for a minute. The fourth watch of the night is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, this is significant because the sea that they were crossing, guess what? Was only five miles wide. All right? So now, for some nine plus hours, guess what they've been doing? They've been rowing against the contrary winds. They've been trying to cross a five-mile sea that should have taken just a little bit of time to get across. Nine to 12 hours later, they're still out there paddling away, and guess what? They ain't made it but about three, three and a half miles. Matter of fact, John said in his gospel, he said they made 25 to 30 furlongs is all they made. Now, they're exactly where God wants them to be. Now, you say, wait a minute now, preacher. Wait a minute. They were exhausted. They were wore out. But let me tell you something. What you read in this verse is the fact that Jesus knew exactly where they were, even though he was miles away in the mountains praying, and he knew exactly what their need was. And let me tell you something. Folks, whether you find yourself in a storm of your own making or in one that is trying to grow you, Jesus knows exactly what you need. Jesus knows exactly your circumstance. And the Bible says, he came unto them. Now, I want you to read just a little further with me. It says in verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're absolutely exhausted. Some of us have, some of us haven't been absolutely exhausted in long years. Some of us who have grandchildren know what it's like to be completely exhausted. But the idea is, is that guess what? When you're exhausted, are you more apt to be on edge? Are you more apt to maybe miss something or misinterpret something? Absolutely, because when Jesus came walking on the water, guess what they thought they saw? It's a ghost. And you say, how in the world could they have believed that it was a ghost? They had just left Jesus earlier in the day. Well, here's the deal. When the storms start blowing, guess what? If we're not real, real careful, we can miss Jesus. When the storms start blowing, we can miss the very one who can help us get through. And because we're exhausted, because we're frustrated, because the storm and the wind have been beating against us, and we've been trying to make headway, and for some reason or another, we're just not doing it. Then when Jesus makes himself available, we miss him. We walk right by it. We're so busy saying, God, get us out of this storm that we forget to say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Because I can assure you, if you're his child, he's trying to teach you something. He's trying to grow. Nothing happens to the child of the king by accident. There's a purpose behind it. You may not understand it at the time, but there absolutely is a purpose behind every storm we find ourselves in. But let's press on. You know the story, verse 27. But it says, but Jesus, or straightway, Jesus 
spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the winds ceased. Now, I want to back up to verse 27, because when Jesus comes on the scene, I want you to notice something. He did not calm the storm. Did you notice that? Now, when you back up to chapter 8, and they're in the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is in the boat... You remember when they, the, they thought they were all going to perish and they went back and they got Jesus. Does anybody remember what happened? He said, peace, be still. Now why, when he comes walking across the water, doesn't he just simply say, peace, be still? Because he could have, is that not right? But he didn't. Have you ever thought about that? Well, I think because he was trying to grow them, guess what? Jesus doesn't always change our circumstances. He doesn't always calm the storm, but he lets the storm have its perfect work, which is what? To grow us, to teach us who we are in Christ Jesus. So, He doesn't change the circumstances. Jesus is interested in changing you and me. He's interested in saying, look, I want you to be more than what you really are. I want you to grow and trust me and believe me and know that I can be depended upon. Because when he says says to them, don't be afraid, it is I. He identifies himself as deity. Now, Peter recognizes him in a different way. And the reason that I want you to understand that is this. Because when Peter says to him, Lord, if it really is you, do what? Let me come out of the boat. Let me step on the water. Now, there are some people who say, you know what? That that Peter really didn't walk on the water, but that he stepped out of the boat and stepped and and began to sink. Now, we know that can't be true because he had to come down out of the boat. Anybody ever stepped out of a boat or off a dock? You don't float a little bit and go, like in the cartoons, "Uh uh-oh, when you step off, what happens? She'll blink, right? If you're my size, it's like twice as fast. Gravity's tough on fat people. But the idea is that he came down out of the boat And the Bible says he walked on water. So we know that he made at least a few steps. He made it far enough that, guess what? When he began to sink, he couldn't reach back and grab hold of the boat. So we don't know how far it was, but we do know that he walked on water. Now, the instant that he loses focus on Jesus, what happens? He sinks. But verse 31 says, when did Jesus reach out to save him? immediately Jesus did what? And he didn't, I don't think he even got his hair wet. Because when the minute he began to sink and he began to look around him and look at his circumstances, he said, Lord, save me. Let me tell you something. When you ask God to save you, he does it immediately. He does it instantly. He does it completely. Amen? Now, Does that make, when we're saved, does that make us perfect? Absolutely not. It just makes us forgiven. Does it make us full grown after we're saved? Absolutely not. We have to, just like Ludell, grow as we feed on the Word of God. Amen? So, the idea is now that Jesus has reached down and lifted him up. Now, I want you to think about something for just a minute. 
Because we've dealt with old Peter, right? We always deal with old Peter. But there's some other folks that were in the boat. Anybody remember that? Anybody? Did I, am I not doohickey? I'm not doohickey. What did I do wrong? There you go. Thank you. So, there's some other guys. And where are they at? They're in the boat. Now, what do you think they thought when Peter said, I'm going to step out on the water? Hey, Peter's over with. Sure was nice working with you. Hey, man, I'm going to tell you what. I liked old Peter. He went out there and done something foolish and drowned So they decided to do what? Stay in the boat. Well, let me ask you a question. What keeps you in your boat today? What keeps you in your lazy boy? What keeps you from stepping out and believing and trusting that God can? Because, see, I don't think the other disciples were fully convinced that Jesus could have Peter to walk on the water. But today, (laughs) many of us fear criticism. Can you imagine what they thought? (laughs) Poor old Peter. You know, when we step out on faith, the first thing we thought, what will other people think? Man, you know, they're they're not going to think. What about this? What about the fear of failure? What if this thing don't work? Whoo, man, I'm going to tell you what. The preacher said we're going to do this or that. What if it don't work? Well, what do we do? What about if people laugh at me? You ever dealt with that? Isn't that so high school? So junior high? People laugh at me. Well, you know what? If you look at Jesus' life by the world standard, it probably would be considered a complete failure. When in reality, what do we know? That he had victory over death, hell, and the grave. Amen? Amen. Because he was the only begotten son of God. I'll be embarrassed. I'll just be embarrassed. Oh, preacher, I'm going to tell you. If I say something, if I come to church at night, I'll be so embarrassed. Why, if I just believe that God can take care of me, and I'll go ahead and tithe, and that don't work, what am I going to do? So we stay in the boat, like the rest of the disciples. I want you to notice something that's unique, and I'm going to hurry up and close on this point. Look with me in verse 32. It says, And when they were come into the ship, the winds ceased. Then they that were in the ship came, and I want you to underline this in your Bible, worshipped him. Saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now, you know, it's interesting. (laughs) Jesus healed a bunch of folks. Remember Jairus' daughter and the people that were dead? He raised. But you know what you don't read at the end of those accounts? The disciples never worshipped him. He had just fed 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people, ever how many there were, with... Five loaves and two fishes. You know what happened? They went and got in a boat. It never said they worshipped him. See, they were amazed. They were awestruck at Jesus. Man, he raised that maid up from the dead. But I tell you what, until they saw him walk on water, they saw him as a human being. And the night he came to them in the storm, they saw him for who he was. God. And they knew then that no matter what they faced, that he would be there. Now think about this for just a minute. Did this experience make Peter perfect? Well, (laughs) if you go down through his life, guess what's going to happen? I think Peter had an aversion to water after this. But I think he had an aversion to chicken. Because does anybody remember what happened at the court when Jesus was, was fixing to be crucified? 
He said, I'll go anywhere with you, Jesus. And he said three times what? You'll deny me? I don't think Peter was a Baptist. I don't think he liked chicken. Because do you think every time that cock crowed, he thought about the time he denied Jesus? And folks, let me tell you something. Sometimes we forget and we focus on our failures and we forget that our God is bigger than all of our stumblings, all of our failures, all of our lack of faith. Our God is bigger than that. And that he can use you no matter where you've been, no matter how many times you've failed, no matter what you've been through. So today I would ask you this. How do you view Jesus? Do you see him today as a healer, a miracle worker, a good man? Or do you see him as God's only begotten son? The one who can and will reach down and save you. The one who can take all of your mistakes, all of your mishaps, all of the ugliness of your life, and can turn it around and make it something beautiful. So today, the real question of this whole service is this. You want to stay in the boat today? Are you going to step out? Are you going to trust him? Are you going to believe him? Preacher, I can't join no church. I'll tell you what, I'm saved, but I can't join no church because, you know, you just don't know my past. Why, people won't accept me. Well, you know what? If Jesus accepts you, I don't care what people think. Amen? Amen? Why, preacher, I, I can't teach that Sunday school class, and, and I can't be faithful to attend service on a regular basis because of all my past failings. You need to get the right view of who Jesus is because he can give you a fresh start today if you'll just but come. Brother David, what number are we going to sing, sir? Number 317. Page 317, as you take your hymnal and stand with me. Turn to page 317 and join me as we pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, once again as we bow in your presence. We worship you, we honor you, we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for your word and this account. Thank you, Father, that just like Peter, you didn't give up on him. And Lord, what you've begun in us, you're going to finish. Father, there are people today who are hurting. There are people today, Father, uh, Lord, right now under the sound of my voice that have had failures and regrets in their life. And Lord, uh, they, they haven't done the things they should have done. But Lord, you can give them a fresh start right here, right now. And Father, for that one that's never received you, that one that doesn't have a relationship with you, Lord, it is our earnest prayer that today would be the day of salvation for them. Whatever the needs of the, your people, whatever they are today, I ask that you meet them according to your riches and glory. And Father, we will praise you, we will worship and honor you, because we've asked in Jesus' name and for his sake. And my family said with me, amen. amen.